Good day and welcome to the Big Bad Tech Channel. I'm your instructor Jim Pytel and today's topic of discussion is the most popular hydraulic actuator in the known universe, the hydraulic cylinder. Our objective today is to take a brief tour of the hydraulic cylinder and introduce you to how it works, the parts that make it work, the schematic symbol, and the terms we're going to be using over and over again for the fluid power lecture series. You may as well get used to them now because you're going to hear them a lot. First and foremost, the hydraulic cylinder is a type of actuator, of which there are numerous different types of actuators. The term actuator is a blanket level term meaning a device that takes one form of input and turns it into usable mechanical output. This is the level above hydraulic cylinder. We could parse the whole actuator designation up using several different perspectives. For example, what is the type of input energy? Is it electrical? Is it hydraulic? Is it pneumatic? Is it thermal? Etc. Also we could divide these actuators up into the type of mechanical output they produce. For example, linear or rotational. Electric motors are great examples of actuators that use electrical energy input to produce rotational mechanical output. The species within the actuator family tree we'll be talking about today, however, uses hydraulic input to produce linear mechanical output. This is my definition of a hydraulic cylinder. There are several different types of hydraulic cylinders and numerous modifications. However, they all do exactly that. They produce linear mechanical output given hydraulic input. Keep in mind additional mechanical linkages or movable connections like trunnions or clevis mounts, which we'll get into later, can modify the initial linear motion. For example, tipping or tilting a load and the spinning of a slewing bearing, as in the pitch mechanism for a modern wind turbine. Again, these are applications we'll visit much later. Let's start this discussion with the identification of the basic parts of a double acting hydraulic cylinder, the most common type of hydraulic cylinder. The schematic symbols appears immediately to the right hand side and you can obviously see the connection between what really makes it and what makes up the schematic. A hydraulic cylinder is obviously cylindrical in shape. There's a cylindrical looking body and a cylindrical rod pokes in and out of it. I suppose you could make them square or triangular in shape, but that'd be stupid and no one does it. All cylinders are cylindrical in shape. Given this non-negotiable fact, it would certainly behoove you to familiarize yourself with the necessary math surrounding the calculation of circular areas and cylindrical volumes if you wish to even have the basic understanding of the working principles behind hydraulic systems. Supporting lectures in the Big Bad Tech Hydraulics playlist will go over basic hydraulics math and Pascal's Law in exhausting detail. Don't worry though, the math is super easy and is really just the same formula used over and over again. Luckily, this lecture doesn't even contain a drop of math, so you can just relax and enjoy the tour. Most of us are familiar with hydraulic cylinders, having seen them at least in passing during day-to-day -day activities. Sometimes you can see connections and hoses or perhaps fixed pipes leading one end or another. There might be different mounts on the body or the rod, which we'll get into later, that allow whatever load is attached to pivot while the rod extends or retracts, or fixed mounts that keep the resultant motion linear. Regardless, the cylindrical body is called the barrel. And as the name implies, the barrel is a hollow cylinder, not a distended wooden barrel used to store pickles, mind you, but the barrel of a rifle, without the rifling, the barrel of a smooth bore shotgun, if you will. Inside this barrel, instead of bullets, shotgun shells, or pickled pig's feet, is this moving circular disc called the piston. The outside edges of the piston slide along the inside edges of the barrel, and the piston smoothly moves up and down inside the barrel. Connected to one end of this moving piston is a cylindrical rod, which is called appropriately enough the rod. The other side of the piston is a bare blank circular disc. Notice the difference in functional area in the travel axis. One side is a full circle. The other side is the same full circle with a missing center portion, a donut or ring-like area if you will. Again, no math, just look at it. Which one has more area, the full circle or the ring? Quite obviously the full circle. We've got to differentiate between these two sides of the same piston because they perform two different functions. So let's give them easy to remember names. Cap end and rod end. Which end of the piston face do you think is called the rod end? If you said the end with a rod sticking out of it, you're correct. This is the one with the smaller functional area. The side opposite the rod end is called the cap end, sometimes called the blind end because it's not the end that sees daylight when the rod is extended. This is the end with a larger functional area. The simple differentiation between the cap end and the rod end is essential to your understanding of the behavior of hydraulic cylinder. And since it's the most popular hydraulic actuator in the known universe, it's pretty essential to your understanding of the behavior of pretty much all hydraulic systems in the known universe.
input pressurized flow acting on either the cap or rod end determines whether the rod attached to the piston extends or retracts. When something is pushing on the cap end side and nothing's resisting it on the rod end side, the cylinder extends into the outside world. When something is pushing on the rod end and nothing's resisting it on the cap end side, the rod retracts back into the barrel. It's really that simple. Push on the cap end, the rod extends. Push on the rod end, the rod retracts. Pause to consider situations where something on the opposite side pushes back with lesser, equal, or greater force, or perhaps refuses to move at all. We'll return to these situations momentarily. What's doing the pushing is pressurized flow being input to either the cap end or the rod end via ports. Ports are like little doors or portals into the barrel. Since there are two ends to the piston, the cap end and the rod end, there are two ports. The cap end port and the rod end port. Since we don't want pressurized flow shooting out at the top or bottom of our barrel, we've got to cover it with end plates. The end plate nearest the cap end and the cap end port is called the cap end plate. The end plate nearest the rod end and the rod end port is called the rod end plate. Terms you'll find are pretty simple for hydraulic cylinders. A major structural difference between the cap end plate and the rod end plate is the obvious fact that the rod sticks out of the rod end plate. Therefore, it's the one with a hole in it. You notice I've drawn two sets of cap end and rod end ports, one being on the rod end plate and the cap end plate, the other set being on the barrel. Be aware the ports can be in either location. When the rod is fully retracted, the piston is sitting at the back of the barrel. To extend it, two things simultaneously happen. The cap end port is open and pressurized flow enters it. The rod end port opens and low pressure flow leaves it. Given pressurized flow is acting on the full circular area of the cap end and for all intents and purposes not being resisted by the rod end, the piston is pushed forward and the rod attached to the other side extends. What this moving piston is creating is an increasing region of space on the cap end side that more pressurized flow can enter. If we fill up this space faster, the rod extends faster. If we fill it up slower, the rod extends slower. It sounds like the flow rate is a major determining factor on our extension speed. Pause to consider the impact of extension speed in situations where a hypothetical flow rate stays the same, yet we try to fill up a larger or smaller volume. We'll return to this momentarily. Now our cylinder has reached the limits of travel because the piston rod end is hitting the rod end plate. We've got to find a way to retract it. Very similar to extension, two things must simultaneously happen. The rod end port is open and pressurized flow enters it. The cap end port opens and low pressure flow leaves it. Given pressurized flow is acting on the annular or ring-like area of the rod end, and for all intents and purposes not being resisted by the cap end, the piston pushes back and the rod attached to it retracts. What this moving piston is creating is an increasing region of space on the rod end side that more pressurized flow can enter. You notice that this region of space on the rod end side is actually smaller in functional volume than the cap end because the solid rod is physically occupying a portion of this volume. The rod upon retraction really is inside the barrel being bathed in the same hydraulic oil that is used to transfer energy. This rod takes up space and reduces the volume necessary to fully retract it. Flow rates being equal, the retraction speed of a cylinder will always be faster than extension simply because there's less volume to fill. The opposite can be said for extension. Flow rates being equal, the extension speed of a cylinder will always be slower than retraction simply because there's more volume to fill because there's no rod on the cap end side taking up space. Since we're trying to keep this lecture math light, just think about it. No math necessary. Just think about it and visualize what the cap end at full extension looks like. And compare it to what the rod end at full retraction looks like. It's quite obvious that the cap end is a full cylinder and obviously requires more fluid to fill than a similarly sized cylinder with a rod-like portion of volume removed from the center. For the purposes of these lectures, we'll assume that the travel length on extension is equal to that of retraction. The ports have no influence on volume, and the thickness of the piston is accommodated by it always occupying the same volume, regardless of extension or retraction. This means both our cap end and rod end cylinders have the same height and the same external diameter. 
It's just that the one on the rod end side has a cylindrical volume removed from the center. If this image doesn't work, use imagery that does. Take a pint glass and fill it with your favorite beer. That's the cap end. Stick a banana in it. That's the rod end. Beer spills out because there's less volume. Actually, erase this image from your mind forever. That's disgusting. Who would ever eat a banana after it's been soaked in beer? Truly half of hydraulics is understanding how the physical construction of the hydraulic cylinder impacts speed and force of extension versus speed and force of retraction. The other half of hydraulics is all the cunning ways we can use various fluid power devices and components to control flow, pressure, and direction and use them to perform awesome work. The other half, yes there's three halves because it's so awesome, is the electrical control of hydraulic systems. This is a really neat integration of both the electrical, mechanical, and hydraulic aspects of a system. We'll get to these topics and more when we get there. Before we continue with the remainder of the content, let me ask a simple question. Which is the input port and which is the output port? The cap end port or the rod end port? The answer is it depends. It depends on which action the cylinder is performing at what time. When the cylinder is extending, the cap end port is our input and the rod end port is our output. When the cylinder is retracting, the rod end port is our input, and the cap end port is our output. In this case, our bi-directional ports are almost performing double duty, hence the name for this type of cylinder with ports on both the cap end and rod end, double acting cylinder. When pressurized flow enters the cap end of a double acting cylinder, obviously the cylinder extends. What is equally important is that while the cylinder is extending, flow is leaving the rod end. By controlling either of these flow rates, input or output, we can effectively control the extension speed of our actuator. We'll go over the component that does this function, called the flow control valve, and discuss different flow control methods in later lectures. Let's consider some basic troubleshooting scenarios. Consider a situation where the rod end port is blocked. This could represent a purposely closed valve position, an improperly routed hose simply not connected to the rod end, or even a screw-in plug purposely inserted into that port. Block ports are often represented on schematics with an X. In this case, would the cylinder ever extend? Again, remind yourself that liquids, unlike gases, are incompressible for our intents and purposes. In this case, there is nowhere the fluid trapped in the rod end side can go, and it resists compression. Therefore, the cylinder will not extend regardless of the input. Conversely, would a double acting cylinder with a completely blocked cap end port ever retract given pressurized flow input to the rod end? The answer again is no. There's nowhere for the cap end volume to go and it resists compression. Now given a situation where a double acting cylinder refuses to extend or retract, before you tap out and run to your lab instructor or boss, take 10 seconds, no 2 seconds to simply look at the other end. Is it blocked or is it even connected? You might have to look at the connection from the side rather than straight on to see if the fitting is only partially complete. Depending on your viewing angle, these things can go unnoticed. I've introduced the block port scenario as if it was a troubleshooting scenario. Realize though this can be deployed to our advantage, for example in the case of a lifted load. Lift the load. Block the port with a closed valve. Turn off your hydraulic power unit and go home for the day. The load stays lifted, provided there are no leaks. If there's a slow leak anywhere on the pressure side, the load will drift downward. Worse yet, someone accidentally bumps the valve to the open position. Your lifted object catastrophically and dangerously and loudly plummets to the earth. Obviously there are safety concerns and interlocks with the system that need to be considered, but for now realize in a leak-free system you need no additional energy to maintain the lift because of the incompressible nature of liquid. In direct contrast to a blocked end port, consider a situation where one of the ends of our double acting cylinder has a leak to the atmosphere. If the leak was on the rod end side, the cylinder would have no issues extending, albeit a small puddle forming on the leak end. The rod end is at low pressure while the cylinder extends. However, consider a case where pressurized flow is entering the rod end and whatever attached to the rod is resisting movement. The rod would not retract and a rapidly expanding puddle would be collecting below a needle-like stream of high pressure flow. Do not attempt to cover this leak with your hand or your face or any other bodily appendage you wish to keep. This is an injection injury waiting to happen, and you must shut down the system and properly remove all sources of hazardous energy before you replace this damaged hose. Finally, consider a scenario where a partially extended double acting cylinder completely full of fluid on both the cap end and rod end is connected via cap end to rod end via hose completely full of fluid. Can you manually retract this rod? Can that cape wearing dork Superman retract this rod? 
Think about it in terms of cylindrical volumes. Can you fit the larger cap end volume into the smaller rod end volume when the stuff you're trying to fit in there is incompressible? Can you fit the volume of a watermelon into a lemon? The answer is no. Consider the opposite scenario. Can you manually extend the rod in this situation? Certainly not with any sense of grace or ease. I suppose if you were strong enough, you could pull really hard and get that smaller rod end volume into the cap end. However, are you strong enough to pull the cap end volume from its liquid phase to vapor phase? I sincerely doubt it. Add to it that your hands are slippery and greasy. Again, if this system is completely full of fluid, what would create the excess volume inside the cap end to make up for the increased volume? Same fluid, more space, less pressure. Liquid to gaseous state, imbalance in pressure, rapid collapse and implosion. Cavitation, not desirable. We'll go into details about this later, but for now, no, you cannot extend it either. Now consider a situation where there exists a certain volume of air in one end or the other, or perhaps the cylinder and hose are completely empty of fluid. You might be able to move the rod because gases are compressible. Be aware, however, that you're creating regions of gaseous high pressure and low pressure, a vacuum because of the volume differential between cap end and rod end. How would one manually retract or extend a cylinder? The easiest way is to have both ports at low pressure. One could dump both to tank pressure or perhaps using an open or float center directional control valve. We'll get into directional control valves later. Basically, you're allowing that volume differential to go someplace else. One last situation before we move on to other topics. Consider another configuration where the rod end is connected to the cap end. Cylinder and hose are both full of fluid. The rod is partially or fully retracted into the cylinder. Notice in this configuration, we have an additional pressurized flow being supplied to both the cap and rod end. Therefore, the same pressure will be seen on both sides of the piston. More area on the cap end because it's a full circle. Less functional area on the rod end because it's a ring. The cylinder extends. As the cylinder extends, the rod end volume still gets routed to the cap end. However, pressurized flow is making up for the volume differential between these two ends. This rapid movement is known as regenerative extension is one of my favorite topics. This last configuration may have gone over the heads of individuals not yet knowledgeable of Pascal's law, or perhaps just seeing this stuff for the first time. But just file it away for now because you will be seeing this again. Given our hydraulic cylinder is filled with fluid, we don't want pressurized fluid spraying everywhere or leaking out of it. So we've got to put some seals between our constituent parts. Notice there are components moving relative to one another. For example, the piston sliding inside our barrel and the rod extending and retracting out of the rod end plate. This is a dynamic interaction. Additionally, there are components that are for the most part fixed, like the cap end plate with respect to the barrel and the rod end plate with respect to the barrel. These end plates would only move with respect to each other if one was to purposely disassemble the cylinder. This is a static interaction. Since our fluid power actuator is using pressurized fluid to transfer energy, the dynamic and static interactions between components call for different sealing mechanisms. The static seal is pretty easy to understand. Static unions for all intents and purposes could be welded or super glued together, provided you never wanted to take them apart again, and the device would still behave as expected. We do, however, want to take them apart at times to perform maintenance and repair operations. Therefore, we could use a gasket for this task. A gasket is a form of pre-cut seal made out of a malleable or crushable material that can be compressed into imperfections in the mating surfaces. For example, the barrel could thread into the cap end plate, but once it bottoms out, we cushion its landing with a compressible material that accommodates for imperfections between the two surfaces and forms a positive seal. Consider the microscopic view of two stationary mating metal surfaces. Notice the valleys and hills don't perfectly coincide with each other like a Lego brick. Instead, there are passageways between them where pressurized flow can sneak out of, no matter how strong you mash them together. Now imagine a malleable material between the two surfaces compressed into the imperfections on either side. This gasket makes the static seal. The gasket could be composed of soft metal or plastic or something special like polytetrafluoroethylene, better known as Teflon, depending on your application. Point is, don't make the gasket out of something that degrades in the presence of whatever hydraulic fluid you're using. Otherwise, the gasket itself would be a source of contaminants and could silt up your valves and render your whole system useless. Moving components require tiny spaces between them, and if this space is taken up by o-ring parts and shredded gaskets, the system won't work well, if at all. Speaking of moving components, think of the two dynamic interactions in our double-acting cylinder, namely the interaction between the piston inside the barrel and the interaction between the rod and the rod end plate. 
Let's look at the piston first. Consider an extension situation where the pressurized fluid in the cap end is interacting with a non-pressurized fluid in the rod end. Extension wouldn't work well if pressurized flow simply just went around the piston into the other side. For this device to work as intended, we need to separate these sides with a dynamic seal, meaning a configuration that creates a positive seal between two components moving relative to one another. A gasket is obviously not our go-to solution in this case because the two surfaces are moving. First off, the piston doesn't really make contact with the barrel as it travels up and down it. It rides on a thin film of fluid coating the barrel walls, and this fluid, believe it or not, is part of what makes the dynamic seal between the cap end side and the rod end side. We'll return to this in a little bit. The other parts of the dynamic seal are the components that fit into an inset on the side of the piston. Inside this trench is an appropriately sized O-ring. Backing up the O-ring is a piston ring, or a backup ring preventing the O-ring from extruding into the opposite side as it drags along the barrel wall. Since the rod both extends and retracts, one would expect at least a pair of backup rings to perform the same function on opposite sides. One could think of this as a delicious piston ring O-ring sandwich. In high pressure applications, one could make this a double or triple or even quadruple decker piston ring O-ring sandwich, creating successive layers of piston ring, O-ring, piston ring, O-ring, piston ring, O-ring, piston ring, O-ring. You get the picture. Keep in mind the piston rings have a break in them, otherwise you couldn't get them on or off. So it's recommended practice to offset them from one another. That way pressurized flow has to go through this confusing labyrinth of piston rings and O-rings if it's really intent on getting to the other side. Pretty soon it'll just get tired and stay on its side of the fence. Let's return to the fluid coating the barrel walls, the other aspect of this dynamic seal, and its interaction with the piston and the piston rings. The piston and piston rings aren't just dragging their way down the length of the barrel metal to metal and gouging out furrows as they go. Think about trying to give a cat a bath. The bathroom hallway probably has a lot of scratch marks as does your face, hands, arms, and neck. This is not an ideal situation. What the piston and piston rings are riding on is a thin coating of fluid covering the barrel walls, and for this reason alone is why the fluid of choice for most hydraulic systems is oil. One of the most common questions I get regarding fluid power systems, especially early in the series, is why do we use oil? Why can't we fill these systems up with water or orange juice or the delicious Mexican cinnamon rice milk drink or chata? The reason we use oil is because it's freaking oil. That's my answer. We use oil because it's oil. In addition to transferring energy and heat like any other liquid, oil lubricates moving surfaces and it seals passageways between moving components because it sticks to the sides of things. Pause the lecture and perform this experiment in whatever environment you may find yourself in right now, even if it's the school library. Take a bucket of water and a bucket of oil and put them on your desk. Stick one hand in the bucket of water and one hand in the bucket of oil. Pull them out. Both hands are covered with either water or oil. The wet one, however, will drip off quicker than the oily one. Again, for this reason alone is why most hydraulic systems use oil as their liquid of choice. The microscopic physics of oil coatings and moving surfaces is truly fascinating stuff and worthy of an entirely separate postdoctorate research project funded by well-moneyed interests so I'm not going to get into high details. The short version is that a moving object sliding on a film of oil creates kind of this wedge-like shape of circulating oil in front of it that rides on the layer of oil stuck to the other surface, thereby preventing the metal-to-metal -metal contact we're so fearful of happening. If you didn't have this film of oil, the piston would gouge out the barrel and probably bind in a partially extended or partially retracted condition. Let's go back to the O-ring I introduced earlier. The term O-ring describes the cross-sectional area of a kind of rubber band looking thing that you could snap around the piston. The material that makes up the O-ring again must be compatible with direct contact with your hydraulic fluid of choice. Don't just grab a rubber band off a crown of broccoli and think that this can do the job. The O-ring is in the only shape there is. You can also have cupped V's, cupped U's, or my personal favorite, the quad ring, which has these little legs that kind of stabilize it as it moves relative to the barrel. What the legs are preventing is a regular O-ring inadvertently getting distorted and potentially pinched off in a piston ring. Keep in mind you've got to install a quad ring, or for that matter any ring, without any twists in it, otherwise the twist points are potential leakage paths. The other dynamic seal we haven't talked about in our double acting cylinder is that between the rod and the rod end plate. For the most part it behaves exactly like our piston and barrel dynamic seal, except the piston ring and O-ring sandwich is inset into a trench on the rod end plate instead of the rod. This way the smooth rod is free to retract or extend into the outside world without pressurized liquid in the rod end leaking out. Consider however the dirty, dirty outside world into which the rod is extending. Is this material you want introduced into the rod end cavity when the rod is retracted? It is for this reason we're going to include an additional component, 
called a rod wiper, which is almost like a set of spatulas scraping off whatever goo is stuck to the rod before it hits the dynamic seal. Imagine yourself being a hazmat worker responsible for demolishing the city concert hall after an insane clown posse concert. I mean, who in their right mind would ever use it again? All the vomit, crack pipe, needles, and juggalo juice is scraped off the rods of your bulldozer as you knock the building into the city dump. The hydraulic system remains clean and is ready to be used the next day to build some kid's park, provided you hose off the rest of the dozer. Speaking of storing hydraulic equipment, given an extended run upon retraction is immediately pulled into the hydraulic fluid, it's a recommended practice to store systems with all the rods retracted. That way all the accumulated dust and bird droppings over a week of inactivity don't make the rod wiper's job hard the first time you retract it and potentially introduce contaminants into your system. Additionally, for heavy earth moving or other conspicuously dirty applications, you may see a heavy fabric cover protecting the rod. This is known as a bellows, and it's kind of like a jack at preventing the rod from getting dirty, and thereby preventing contamination of your hydraulic fluid. Let's go over some additional modifications you might see to double acting cylinders. A real simple modification you might see on a hydraulic cylinder, specifically one with an extremely long rod and travel length, is something called a stop tube. A stop tube is kind of like additional support for the rod when it's reached maximum extension. It's almost like a smaller barrel that fits inside the main barrel that limits the rod from fully extending and prevents the piston from kinking and jamming inside the barrel. Imagine a situation where an extremely long rod is fully extended horizontally with a big heavy box of widgets dangling off the end of the rod. It's already sagging because of the long torque arm. Now another big box of widgets falls off the assembly line and hits it. And bang, the piston is jammed. And you've got a big old mess on your hands to repair. A stop tube ideally prevents this situation occurring. With it inserted in the rod end, it prevents full extension, and it's almost like another set of hands helping out the rod end plate and rod end wiper hold the rod at full extension. One of the most basic concepts I've been going over is the volume differential between cap and rod end because of the existence of the rod on one side and the conspicuous absence on the other. Imagine though a cylinder with two rods and two rod ends and two rod end plates. Appropriately enough, this is called a double rod cylinder. An advantage of this is that while it's pushing on one side, it's pulling on the other, and vice versa. You may be able to stagger your workflow on an assembly line and make use of a single actuator to perform opposite tasks on opposite assembly lines simultaneously. For example, pulling the next widget into place on one side and stamping not for human consumption onto the widget on the other side. The schematic symbol for a double rod, double acting cylinder obviously has a rod at both ends. Not sure if any of you will even have the remotest idea of what I'm talking about, but maybe once every four months we used to play this horrible, horrible game in the army. It involved two opposing teams of aggressive young men pushing a giant ball. When I say giant, I mean like eight foot plus diameter ball. Not kidding. Back and forth across a muddy field. The more players on a team and the muddier the field, the better. If your team pushed it to the other side of the field, you won. We only played this game every four months because that was the time period it took for most people to heal between bouts. Anyways, the secret to winning this game was to have half your team punching and kicking and elbowing the other team, while the other half of your team pushed the ball forward. Problem is, not everybody on the pushing side could get to the ball, so you ended up just pushing the muddy and bloody back of the guy in front of you that was pushing the ball in the right direction. This is kind of like the tandem or duplex cylinder. It's a set of two double acting cylinders, where the first one is being assisted in extension, by the second one pushing on its back. In this case, there's a hole in the back of the first one, into which the rod from the back one is extending into the cap end cavity and pushing on the piston face. What you get is pressurized input from the first one working to extend the rod and the pressurized input from the second one acting on the same piston face. The advantage of this combination is you obviously get an increase in force without having to resort to a larger cylinder or higher pressure. A narrow clearance space between two objects might call for this application. The differentiation between the terms tandem and duplex refer to the type of connection between the primary and support cylinder. A tandem is meant to be permanently connected and for all intents and purposes is a single unit. A duplex is meant to be disassembled and you can separate the two halves. Another common modification you might see is something called a cushion. Like the term cushion implies, it softens the landing when the cylinder reaches the limits of travel. The schematic symbol shows a cushion on extension, cushion on retraction, and a cushion on both extension and retraction. If there's an arrow on the cushion, it means it's an adjustable cushion, meaning one can control the deceleration rate of our cylinder. The cushion isn't a pillow or a bunch of feathers softening impact, but rather it's almost like a tiny flow control valve that is only active at the very final limits of travel. 
For a cushion on extension, the rod end face will have this plug on it, and at the end of the barrel will have a hole into which this plug will fit. As the piston extends, it'll do so at full speed as long as the hole in the center is clear. However, when the plug and the piston engages with a hole, there's no passageway for the little bit of fluid remaining to leave the rod end port, except for a tiny, tiny little passage right here. This little passageway slowly drains this remaining fluid and thereby decelerates the piston before it bottoms out. If in its adjustable cushion, you can vary the size of this orifice to rapidly or slowly decelerate the piston. This is kind of like a flow control being used in a meter out arrangement, something we'll get to in later lectures. Let's go outside our cylinder and see how the mounting method changes its realm of influence. Mounting methods are divided between fixed mounts or pivot mounts. Fixed mount includes lugs, almost like ears hanging off the end plates. A flange is very similar in that it's an extension and you're bolting the cylinder to something. A flush mount means there are bolts extending from the end plates and you can just poke them through something and put a nut on the other side. Tie rods are pretty cool because in addition to providing a mounting means from one end to another, they're acting to compress the rod end plate and cap end plate onto the barrel. Depending on how you orient the end plates when you put the tie rods back in, you can have the rod end port and cap end ports on the same side, opposite sides, or 90 degrees offset. All these fixed mounts, due to their fixed nature, are delivering purely linear motion. A hydraulic cylinder itself is innately a linear actuator. However, if mounted in such a manner that it can pivot while it extends or retracts, it can produce rotational tipping motion. The two main methods of pivot mounting include clevis mounts and trunnion mounts. Notice I'm pronouncing the term clevis and not clevis. Don't be the dude that spoils an otherwise stunning interview by telling them all about clevis mounts, carter pins, exand gates, and how energy and power are interchangeable terms. All of that is nonsense and you will be laughed out of the room. Anyways, a clevis is like another ear-like thing with a hole inside it. Inside that hole is sometimes a bearing that maybe has a zerk or grease fitting. That grease fitting has nothing to do with the cylinder, it's only related to the mechanical union. With a clevis hooked to something solid, the rest of the cylinder is free to swing in an arc, or as the name implies, pivot. You can have a clevis at either the rod end or the cap end or both. Most likely there's a pin that threads through this hole and locks in place with a cotter pin, not a carter pin. A trunnion is very similar in that it allows a cylinder to pivot from a fixed point, but it does so with almost two arm-like extensions that come off the side. Depending on where the arms are located, either centrally or favoring one end, the cylinder can pivot from that point and still extend linearly, but act rotationally because of the pivoting mount. These are two common methods of mounting a hydraulic cylinder to hydraulically pitch the blades of a modern wind turbine generator. The rod tip has a clevis mount attached to a slewing bearing, and the barrel is trunnion mounted inside the hub. As the cylinder extends or retracts the slewing bearing, and the blade attached to the slewing bearing rolls clockwise or counterclockwise, pitching itself into or out of the wind, thereby changing the angle of attack on our blade and directly controlling the input speed of our generator in the nacelle. This is a great application of hydraulics when pivoting cylinder mounts. One would think we've reached the end of things we could talk about regarding double acting cylinders, and for the most part we have. However, we've yet to even open discussions about a closely related linear hydraulic actuator, the single acting cylinder. Luckily, everything we've discussed about our double acting cylinder applies directly to the single acting cylinder, and we could breeze through this discussion rather quickly. The major distinction between a double acting cylinder and a single acting cylinder is that the single acting cylinder has only one port at only one end and only performs one action. When pressurized flow enters the cap end port on this single acting cylinder, it can only extend. The obvious question is how does it retract once I've extended it? Do you have to go buy a new one every single time? No. A single acting cylinder can still retract passively because they're used in situations where the outside environment provides the force necessary for retraction. An example of a single acting cylinder would be that chintzy little jack that came with your car. By using the hand pump, you're inputting pressurized flow into the cap end with the valve in one position and the cylinder extends. When you switch to the other valve position, the weight of the car and gravity push the fluid out of the cap end and the cylinder retracts. For a passively retracting single acting cylinder, there's really nothing on the end at all, except perhaps an air vent to get rid of the air or fluid that may be trapped on the other side. If you think about it, there's really no reason for having a rod end at all, so sometimes you'll see a thick rod that takes up the whole rod end. This is sometimes called a ram, and when someone says, go get me that ram and let's lift this big bridge, they mean, go get me a single acting hydraulic cylinder with a big rod.
use pressurized flow to extend the ram, do whatever you've got to do to the bottom of the bridge. I don't know, paint it or let some really tall sailboat go under it. Then the weight of the bridge retracts the cylinder. Obviously, you don't just release pressure all at once, otherwise it'll come crashing down, but you let the pressure bleed out slowly so the bridge does a controlled descent. You'll learn about meter out flow configurations in later lectures. Another great example of a single acting cylinder with additional modifications is the telescoping ram seen in the back of a dump truck, where pressurized flow enters the cap end and the rod extends in telescoping pieces, thereby enabling lengthy extension in a compact package when fully retracted. The weight of the bed retracts the telescoping rod when pressurized flow is allowed to leave at a controlled rate. The schematic symbol in the actuator itself kind of looks like an old school pirate telescope. Gravity induced retraction for a single acting cylinder wouldn't work outside of a vertical plane or up in space. However, if the rod end cavity was filled up not with fluid as in the case of a double acting cylinder, more rod or empty air as in a normal single acting cylinder, but perhaps a spring whose natural inclination is to expand. In this case, even if the single acting cylinder was horizontal, upside down, or at the farthest reaches of our solar system, it would still retract unless pressurized flow entered the cap end. In its de-energized state, the single acting cylinder would be retracted. An example application would be a brake system that only applies the brakes when told to do so by pressurized flow. In the absence of pressurized flow, the spring asserts itself and retracts the cylinder. Now be aware the spring itself can be a source of hazardous energy and one must follow safe maintenance procedures to avoid injury. Now let's consider the opposite application. What if we wanted to create a fail-safe brake system that applies the brakes in the loss of pressure or power? A classic example of this is the rotor brake in a modern wind turbine generator. If there's a loss of power or pressure, the brakes apply and safely bring the rotor to a stop. This is done via a spring on the cap end and a single input port on the rod end. This is still a single acting cylinder. When pressurized flow enters the rod end, the cylinder retracts, thereby disengaging the brakes. However, in the absence of pressure or sudden loss of pressure in an emergency situation, the spring asserts itself and extends the cylinder, thereby applying the brakes. In its de-energized state, this cylinder is extended. Again, the spring itself can be a source of hazardous energy and you must be aware of this danger prior to performing maintenance and repair procedures on such an actuator. Let's take a look at a couple images of hydraulic cylinders and see if we can apply what we've learned. By all means, pause the lecture and see if you can identify the parts as we progressively rip this thing apart. Here's a double acting cylinder with clevis mounts on both the cap end plate and the tip of the rod. There are tie rods holding the cap end and rod end onto the barrel. The rod end port and the cap end ports are located on the respective end plates. First, we'll take off the clevis attachment on the rod end. The rod end and cap end plates aren't screwed onto the barrel, but are rather held together with tie rods. Let's take the tie rods off. Now we can pop the cap end off. Notice the O-ring forming the static seal between the end plate and the barrel. We could slide the rod and the piston out of the barrel. The rod end plate is still attached to the rod. You can take a look down the barrel. It's smooth and shiny, it doesn't show any noticeable signs of gouging or impact. With the rod removed from the rod end plate, we could take a look at the O-ring forming the static seal between the rod end plate and the barrel. Additionally, we can see the rod end port. When we flip it over, we could see the rod wiper inside the hole from which the rod extends. This is again a dynamic seal because the rod slides along the rod wiper as it extends and retracts. The threaded rod is attached to the piston with a nut. We could unscrew the nut and pop the piston off. You could see the O-ring and backup ring sandwich inside the groove on the perimeter of the piston. This is the dynamic seal between the barrel and the piston that separates the rod end from the cap end and vice versa. There you have it. All the parts that when assembled in the proper manner form the linear hydraulic actuator known as the double acting cylinder. Truly horrifying in its complexity. Just kidding. I hope this is pretty easy to follow. If you want to reassemble it, you could pretty much play the last sequence in reverse, ignoring any subliminal messages you might hear in the audio track. Last set of images are two more double acting cylinders. Notice this one has no cap end plate. It's welded onto the barrel. Like I said, the union of the cap end plate and barrel is a static seal. You can't get much more static and more sealed than welding something together. Notice its ports are both at one end. However, the pipe leading to the rod end routes the appropriate fitting to the rod end. The last image is the big boy heavy hitter. This is something one of my students removed from a full size wind turbine pitch mechanism. Notice it has a trunnion mount on the barrel and a clevis mount on the rod. Again, cap end and barrel are all one static sealed piece. 
The ports are on the barrel. One of the features I wanted to draw your attention to is the tiny fitting near the rod end. This is a check valve fitting to which a technician can attach a portable manometer or pressure gauge to determine the pressure in the rod end cavity. There's another one on the cap end side, kind of hidden below it. These are extremely useful access points for troubleshooting analysis and enable a technician to obtain valid pressure data at the point of use. These fittings have covers chained to them and it's incumbent upon you to screw them back on when you're done using them. The covers keep contaminants from entering our hydraulic system. Finally, the projection on the back of the cylinder is a position transducer, meaning a device that can measure the extension or retraction position of the cylinder rod. The transducer measures the position of the rod using an LVDT, Linear Variable Differential Transformer, a linear resistance transducer, or even ultrasonic means, and then outputs an appropriate analog or digital voltage or current signal to the controller. Using this data, the controller can then decide to extend or retract it a little more, or keep it the same given the output speed of the generator. This is a pretty high-tech modification to what is ordinarily considered a low-tech brute laborer. All right, I think we've covered enough material for this session and arrived at a point where we need to wrap it up. In conclusion, we examine the constituent parts of the double-acting and single-acting cylinder, both of which are linear hydraulic actuators. Additionally, we learn common terms, schematic symbols, modifications, and mounting methods found on cylinders. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. You never know when or where you'll be called upon to apply your knowledge of double and single acting cylinders, but rest assured you most certainly will be called upon. When that occasion arises, you'll be up to the task. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech YouTube channel for additional resources and updates.